Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Open our eyes to see the things that Jesus sees. Open our ears to hear the words that you have for us today. Open our hearts to receive your message and change our lives that we might truly represent Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, to all of those who do not yet know him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever noticed that two different people can see the exact same thing and yet see two very different things? For example, in this picture, the one sees four. I'm not sure what they are. They look like posts to me. And the other one sees three. And if I look at it from this side, I see four. And if I look at it from that side, I see three. What do you see in the next picture? How many of you see a young woman looking away, kind of the, almost the back side and the side? No one sees a, a young woman? Anybody see an old woman? When you look at this picture, some people will see a young woman, and some will see an older woman. If you're seeing the young woman, you can probably see the older woman if you notice that the young woman's, um, this, her chin is the old woman's nose, and the young woman's necklace is the old woman's mouth. If you're seeing the old woman, the young woman is, is looking away, and the part that flips up is, the, is probably the front of her hat. Different people see different things. Depends on our perspective. Last Sunday, we invited our younger adults to tour our building and tell us what they see. The building looks different to younger people than it does to older people. The building looks different from different to new people than it does to people who have grown up here. What you see depends on your perspective. We, as modern or perhaps postmodern Christians who live in Muleshoe, Texas, have a certain perspective. We see the world in a certain way. But we're studying Jesus' life and ministry, as told in the Gospel of Luke, in order to try to learn to see the world the way that Jesus sees it. And this is hard for us sometimes, just as it was sometimes hard for Jesus' original disciples to see as Jesus sees. Again and again, in his teaching and in his lifestyle, Jesus tried to show his disciples that the kingdom of God is very different from the way things are done in the world. In fact, in the kingdom of God, things are often reversed. Some say upside down from the way things are in the world. In the kingdom of God, the poor are blessed, the blind receive their sight, those who are held captive are set free, little children are given honor, and the rich have a hard time getting in. Though the disciples heard Jesus speak about this reversal over and over, they still had a hard time understanding it, and especially practicing it in their daily lives. Jesus knew that it was hard for his disciples to adopt this new way of seeing, of thinking, of understanding, of living. But he was patient with them and continued to try to help them to learn to see the things that he saw and to live in the kingdom of God, even while they were still living in this world. In today's passage, Jesus once again tries to explain to his disciples how different the kingdom of God is from the world. Jesus tells his disciples that he must suffer in the world as he lives out the reversed kingdom values. Our scripture passage for today is found in the Gospel of Luke, ch chapter 18, verses 31 through 43. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, Luke 18, 31 through 43, or the words will be on the screen. 
as Linda mentioned, we've been studying the book of Luke for some time, and we're all the way up to chapter 18. Chapter 18, starting with verse 31. Then he, Jesus, took the twelve aside and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. But they understood nothing about all these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he, the blind man, heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people who saw it praised God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Jesus knew what was going to happen to him when he got to Jerusalem. And Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for what would happen to him there. This is not the first time that he told them what was going to happen. If we went all the way back to chapter 9, remember, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say I am? And Peter answered correctly, The Messiah of God. And then Jesus told his disciples that as the Messiah of God, he must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the religious leaders and on the third day be raised. And then again, after his transfiguration on the mountain, Jesus told his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. But the disciples did not understand. In chapter 9, verse 51, Luke told us, and we read, that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing full well what was going to happen there. And from that time on, the setting of our story that we've been reading has been Jesus' journey toward Jerusalem. From today's passage, we know that Jesus is getting pretty close to Jerusalem because Jericho is about 12 and a half miles from Jerusalem. And so as they were getting close to Jerusalem, once again, Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for what was going to happen when they arrived in Jerusalem. Jesus tried to help them understand that the horrible things that were about to happen had been predicted by the prophets of long ago because it was all part of God's plan to redeem the world. Jesus' suffering is another example of how things in this world are reversed from the way things are in the kingdom of God. God's Son, the long-awaited Messiah, our Redeemer, who came to bring good news to us, would be rejected in this world, and he would suffer at the hands of those who have power in this world. And those who live by the values of this world reject the kingdom of God and the one who brought it. And those who choose to live in the kingdom of God will likely suffer in this world. And yet, and yet, the evil forces of this world will never overcome the goodness of God. 
God would raise his son from the dead, reversing the wrong and making it right. Not just vindicating Jesus, but also as a sign to you and to me that no matter how bad things get in this world, the kingdom of God will prevail. And those who suffer in the kingdom, those who suffer for the kingdom of God now will be vindicated and blessed for eternity in the kingdom of God. So Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for what was going to happen in Jerusalem, but they did not understand what he said. They could not imagine how or why the Messiah would suffer in Jerusalem. It just did not make any sense to them. They had seen the power of God in Jesus doing amazing things. How could he suffer and die? After all, they had seen Jesus cleanse lepers, cast out demons, feed thousands of people with just five loaves and two fish, heal sick and crippled people, and even bring those who were dead back to life. If Jesus had this kind of power, power that they knew was from God, surely he could overcome anyone who tried to harm him, couldn't he? Jesus' disciples did not understand that it was not a matter of whether or not Jesus had the power to overcome those who opposed him. Jesus obviously had the power. But because Jesus lived in the kingdom of God, he would not use his power against anyone, even when they decided to kill him. Instead, Jesus would humbly suffer because that is what Jesus came to do. But the disciples did not understand. They could not see it. Still, his disciples followed Jesus on toward Jerusalem. And as they got to, Jer to Jericho, a crowd heard that Jesus was coming, and they went out to greet him. Now, a blind man who was sitting by the road begging heard the commotion and asked what was happening. And someone told him Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now, evidently, the blind man had heard of Jesus and his healing power. And he began to call out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Though the blind man could not physically see, he had insight beyond those around him who only saw that Jesus was from Nazareth. The blind man saw that Jesus was the long-awaited son of King David. In other words, that Jesus was the Messiah. Now those who were between the blind men and Jesus ordered him to be quiet. But the blind men shouted even more loudly, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me! Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me! And Jesus heard his cry. And he stopped. And he had the blind man brought to him. And then Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, it might seem obvious to us what the blind man wanted, but when a blind beggar said, have mercy on me, he might very well have been asking for money. That was the way they asked for money. That's how they begged. Have mercy on me. But this blind man saw who Jesus was, and he believed that Jesus could give him much more than money. The blind man said to Jesus, Lord, let me see again. And Jesus said, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. And immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God. And those who saw what had happened praised God along with him. In this story, we see the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, which Jesus read and claimed to fulfill. We read about this way back when Jesus began his public ministry in Luke chapter 4. Jesus said that he came to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release for those held captive, and recovery of sight to the blind. The kingdom of God had come into the world. 
the blind could see. And this blind man could see the kingdom of God in Jesus. But the disciples could not. You see, it was just this sort of experience that made it very difficult for Jesus' disciples to understand that Jesus would suffer and die in Jerusalem. Seeing with their eyes the amazing things that Jesus could do made it very hard for these disciples to see with their imagination why Jesus would have to suffer. As Jesus' disciples today, it's sometimes hard for us to understand why do people have to suffer? Why do good people have to suffer? Why doesn't Jesus heal us or our loved ones when we pray for healing? Why doesn't God use his power to solve the problems in our world? From our perspective, it only makes sense. But if we look at it from a different perspective, what will we see? There's a recent Christian song by Matthew West that starts out like this. I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble now. Thought, how'd we ever get so far down? How's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? And he said, I did. I created you. Now there's a different perspective. You know, not only is it hard for us to see the kingdom of God in the midst of the world, but it's also sometimes hard for us to see the world as it is today because we're so used to seeing, as it, seeing it as it was yesterday. Now, the world has always changed over time, but now it seems that it changes so much more quickly. And the way that we have done church in the past, well, it's not very effective for reaching new people with the good news of Jesus Christ today. We need God's help to see the people in our world who need Jesus, but who are blind to his very presence. We need to learn to see the people around us who are crying out for help. And we need courage to share with them our faith in Jesus. And sometimes we need to do something. One of the main things that Jesus expects his disciples to do is to make more disciples by sharing our faith with others. Now I know that sharing our faith with others is not something that most of us feel very comfortable doing. I don't know if you can see what this says. Uh, the fellow says, I was just fine with the concept of sharing my faith until pastor said we actually had to talk to people. It's not comfortable for most of us. We're not in the habit of sharing our faith. But it is what Jesus calls us to do. And as... Sally Messenger told you a couple of weeks ago, our theme for this year's Northwest Texas Annual Conference was, Let the Redeemed of the Lord Say So. Let the Redeemed of the Lord Say So. In other words, let us share with others how God has changed our life. This morning I'm going to let you see the theme video from our conference. We're going to watch that video. It's just a couple of minutes long.
If we have been redeemed, then we need to learn how to tell our story so that others can be redeemed. With that in mind, I invite you to join me in studying the book, Get Their Name. The purpose of this book is to help us learn how to share our faith, to help us help new people come to know and follow Jesus. In your bulletin, you should have an insert that looks like this. It's the darker yellow one. If you'd like to join this study, I want to ask you to fill out your name and let me know if you need us to order a book. Now, if you're in a discipleship group on Sunday mornings, you've probably already been counted that you are going to be a part of this study. But if you're not in a discipleship group on Sunday morning, then I invite you to fill out this form and join us. One of the recommendations of our Healthy Church Initiative report is that we have a church-wide study of this particular book. So I invite you to join me in this study, which will begin next Sunday, July 6th, and will continue every Sunday morning in July and August. We will meet in the Fellowship Hall, and it will start at 9.45 each Sunday morning. This study will challenge us to grow as disciples. It will call us to see our church and our world from a different perspective. It will give us opportunities to practice sharing our faith. And if we're willing, I believe that God will use this study to help us become more and more like Jesus. I believe that if we will apply what we learn from this study, we will increase our ability to accomplish our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So, I invite you to join me starting next Sunday at 945 in the Fellowship Hall. If you're not in a discipleship group, if you fill this out, let me know if you need me to order you a book. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you created us to join you in ministry. You've, you've come to each one of us in some way or we wouldn't be here this morning. We believe in you. And you believe in us. You believe in us to share the good news with others. That Jesus came to redeem them. This is not comfortable for us. And so we need your power. Send the Holy Spirit upon us. Give us the courage to take one step forward. And may that first step maybe be to read and study this book together. Maybe the first step is to pray for courage. Maybe the first step is to open our eyes and see our neighbor who's hurting and ask ourselves, what might I do? Help us to answer your call. Let us, as the redeemed, say so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.